M S W Media. I signed an order appointing Jack Smith. Nobody knows you. And those who say of Jack is a fanatic. Mr. Smith is a veteran career prosecutor. Wait, what law have I broke? The events leading up to and on January 6th. Classified documents and other presidential records. You understand what prison is? Send me to jail. Welcome to episode 94 of Jack, the podcast about all things special counsel. It's Sunday, September 15th, 2024. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Andy McCabe. Well, now that Jack Smith's appeal is filed down in Florida, and we're still 11 days from the deadline for special counsel to file their immunity brief in D.C., we got a little breathing room, Allison, (laughs) a little little stretch and reflect moment. And we're going to use it to discuss two amicus briefs that were filed with the 11th Circuit in the Florida case that was, of course, dismissed by Judge Eileen Cannon on the grounds that Jack Smith was appointed and funded improperly. Yes. And given Trump's repeated claims, by the way, that none of his 2020 election cases were decided on the merits, we thought we'd debunk that for you as well. Uh, And then we'll have some listener questions. But first, it's time for another installment. Of good week, bad week. <laughs> Maybe we should just skip it this week. Yeah, what I think. You, what do you uh, think? And it's Yikes. obvious. Moving on. Yeah, it's uh, wow. That debate, yeah. she crushed him. She crushed him. Oof. Uh, yes. Yeah, she did. And um, wow. I mean, I don't even know what to say. It's been, People have been talking about it for days and days, and I can't add much to that. But I'll, I, I can just say that as I was watching, and I'm sure everybody else had the <laughs> same reaction. You know, I had been kind of tracking the J.D. Vance's, you know, posting about the infamous pet eating con- non-controversy in Ohio over over the days before the debate. And so I had been thinking like, oh, my God, what is this guy thinking? How did he get duped into this, you know, going down this rabbit hole that was so clearly false? And then in the debate, when Trump started talking about it, I felt myself saying, oh, no, no, no. It was like watching somebody steer off of a mountain road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was, I mean, not that I was rooting for the guy, but I just like, oh my God, are we really going to do this on a debate? You're going to throw this out? This is such obvious insanity. And sure enough, man, he just went right with it. Dude. Yeah. I did a couple of TV hits and put out a tweet about what, how, you know, why I thought that the ABC moderators who, you know, unlike the first debate, didn't agree to not fact check him, right? They right. They didn't bar that from happening. And so I put out a list. I'm like, here's some things that we know he's going to say. Here are some lies we know he's going to tell that you can fact check in real time. You don't have to, you know, a lot of people, it's impossible to fact check him. Sure. But it's not. There's things that we know he's going to say. You know, crime is up, 25 million illegal immigrants in the country. Just like lies that are obvious. Election was stolen. Yeah, election was stolen. Just obvious stuff. And and a lot of people commented like, hey, you know, I don't see the... uh, uh, gender confirmation surgeries by the school nurse uh, lie or the the cats being eaten in Springfield lie. And I actually said, I doubt he's going to go, gonna go there, there, right? <laughs> like those, I'm going with the very, you know, the, the obvious lies. I don't think he's going to bring up sharks and batteries. And I certainly don't think he's going to, he wouldn't go there. But she was so masterful at laying traps that he did. And, yeah. and well, for the, it wasn't that uh, people were getting gender confirmation surgery at school. It was transgender illegal aliens getting surgeries in prison, um, and mm-hmm. so it was a little bit of different of a, of a of an outrageous, weird claim. Uh, but yeah, I was even like, ah, he's he's being right now. He's being prepped to not go there, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he did, and so that that t- I was taken aback, um, and. I, I realized it was because of her ability to lay little traps, talking about his crowd size, talking about how Putin could eat him for lunch, talking about how yeah. everyone's laughing at him. Like these just she would lay these little traps uh, in between debunking one of his previous lies and then talking about her policy. She would just lay these little traps and boy, he fell right into them. So that was that was where I was a little bit surprised. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's where you really see the former prosecutor in Harris come out. People talk about her. She talks about her prosecutorial history a lot. People always refer to that. 
And I think in most people's minds, they think of former prosecutor and they're imagining like the Perry Mason moment, you know, they're like, yes, you did, sir. And isn't that, you know, were you, isn't <laughs> were you lying when you said it or when you're lying when you didn't say it, that kind of thing. And there's a, there's some of that in uh, criminal law and even in, in civil law in trials when you're examining a witness, but not much. Really what's much more common and a much more uh, important skill is what you saw the other night, the ability to lay those traps, to ask a question, to tee up a topic or encourage a witness to speak about something that they probably shouldn't talk about, and then you have it out there. So I really mm -hmm. feel like she relied on uh, on that history and those and those sorts of like trial lawyer prosecutor skills. Boy, it was to great effect. She she did an incredibly capable job of uh, of luring him down roads that I'm sure no none of his advisors wanted him to go down. Yeah, it reminded me of what they did to that Trump lawyer at the end of the Cohen, you know, the hush money trial. Yeah, where they brought him up and kind of laid these little traps, and he just went off and went crazy. Um, and, yeah. and said or, a bunch of totally discredited himself, right? In the eyes of the jury and the judge. Yeah. Or Mark Meadows testifying at his own removal uh, hearing. Like uh -huh. he, he destroyed himself in yeah. that testimony. So that's what a really skilled lawyer will do. They'll help the witness, uh, you know, an adverse witness, they'll help them kind of, uh, hang themselves. And pff, she did. <laughs> yeah. So bad week, uh, for Donald Trump. And I actually think a good week for Jack Smith. And I say that because of the two amicus briefs we're about to cover that were filed on on his behalf, you know, on the on the side of the special counsel um, and actually do what he did not do, uh, which is to ask for Judge Cannon to be removed from the case. So, you know, I think he's getting a little boost here with uh, some some legal folks making the case for him so he doesn't have to. And also reminding the court that they can do this without Jack Smith asking. So let's head down to Florida where these two big amicus briefs have been filed with the 11th Circuit. Again, they're arguing on behalf of Jack Smith. Both briefs, like I said, do something that Jack Smith didn't do. And this it not only takes the burden off him, but it takes the, the stain off of him, right, for asking for this. But they Absolutely. both asked the 11th Circuit to remove her from the case and reassign it to a different judge. The first brief we'll cover was submitted by uh, in, in September, on September 3rd, by Stephen Hirsch on behalf of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or CREW, Nancy Gertner, Stephen Gillers, and James Sample. It's 53 pages, and full disclosure, our under seal SEPA expert, Brian Greer, is cited in this brief. <laughs> yeah, yes, he is. He pokes his little former CIA head up in the most curious places. Um, also, full disclosure, uh, just to put this out there, a few years ago, Crew was actively engaged in FOIA lawsuits seeking the release from DOJ of all the documents related to my firing. And although they did that entirely independently. I had nothing to do with those efforts. Um, I, I personally think I benefited from their work. And so I just want to put that out there on the record. Yeah, we all do. All right. So let's hit the introduction of this particular brief, the crew brief. Amic, the amici urge this court, if it reverses the judgment in this case, to order the case reassigned to another district judge on remand pursuant to the court's supervisory authority under 28 U.S. Code Section 2106. If the court reverses Judge Eileen Cannon's ruling in this matter, it will be the third time in under three years that it has had to do so in a seemingly straightforward case about a former president's unauthorized possession of government documents. But citing the mere number and frequency of reversals does not fully capture the problem. For some of Judge Cannon's rulings have been so unprecedented that affirming them would, in this court's words, this court's words, quote, violate bedrock separation of powers limitations and require a radical reordering of our case law limiting the federal court's involvement in criminal investigations. That's what the 11th Circuit wrote. Yeah, about that is a Judge that's a great site right in the mm -hmm. top end of the brief. That's like getting their attention like, whoa, we've, we've been down this road before. <laughs> yeah, here's what you said about it before. Reminder, they go on to say a third reversal now will come after Judge Cannon dismissed this case in a decision that hinged on ignoring the plain text of our federal statutes and dismissing as dicta a landmark Supreme Court opinion confirming the attorney general's power to appoint a special counsel. A reasonable member of the public could conclude, as many have, 
that the dismissal was the culmination of Judge Cannon's many efforts to undermine and derail the prosecution of this case. Early on, Judge Cannon expressed her beliefs that the criminal prosecution of a former president entails stigma in a league of its own and, quote, reputational harm of a decidedly different order of magnitude, a belief at odds with, quote, our nation's foundational principle that our law applies to all without regard to numbers, wealth, or rank. A reasonable observer could conclude, and that reasonable observer phrase is going to come in handy in a minute, mm-hmm. they could conclude that she has acted in accordance with a conviction, or a conviction that prosecuting a former president for retaining official documents, over a hundred of which are marked classified, is an intolerable affront to his dignity. So that's what the introduction says. And uh, real briefly, uh, the court's powers that they cited under 28 United States Code Section 2106, that code says the Supreme Court or any other court of appellate jurisdiction, which is the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit, yeah. May affirm, modify, vacate, set aside, or reverse any judgment, decree, or order of a court lawfully brought before it for review, and may remand the cause and direct the entry of such appropriate judgment, decree, or order, or require such further proceedings to be had as may be just under the circumstances. So that whole, you can remand it, review it, and remand it, and, you know, require further proceedings that may be just, that's the part where they can reassign. For real, yeah. This just gives them a very broad kind of uh, field of fire, as it were, for whatever is necessary pursuant to their judgment on appeal. So they can remand it, they can direct the court, the lower court, to take some specific action, you know, or, and and of course, that could, in, that could involve reassigning the, the uh, judge. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the authors of the brief then give us a roadmap for their arguments as the introduction continues. They go on to say, here we focus on three controversies that considered together afford the court more than adequate grounds to reassign the case upon remand. One, Judge Cannon's unprecedented assertion of equitable jurisdiction to block the government from using or even viewing documents seized at Mar-a-Lago pursuant to a lawful search warrant. Two, Judge Cannon's inexplicable call for jury instructions on a spurious legal defense that would have gutted the government's case had it ever gone to trial. And three, Judge Cannon's failure over the course of one year to move the case forward in any significant way until a one justice concurrence in the Supreme Court's presidential immunity opinion expressed approval of the novel constitutional theory that allowed her to end the case. Viewed together, these events confirm that Judge Cannon has, quote, engaged in conduct that gives rise to the appearance of a lack of impartiality in the mind of a reasonable member of the public. And that site is United States versus Torkington from the 11th Circuit in 1989. They also confirm that a reasonable member of the public would believe that she cannot be counted upon to put aside her negative views of the case if and when it returns to her. Accordingly, as discussed below, the court should order this case reassigned to another district judge on remand. Mm. Torkington. Tell me about Torkington, Yeah, so this this is a (laughs) good one. Because this comes up a lot. For sure. So you got to put on your time machine hat, go back to 1985. It's full on like Miami Vice, you know, glitz and glam, pastel suits with t-shirts, the whole nine. And then John Torkington, who's a guy who operated a booth at a flea market in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, at which Mm -hmm. he sold watches. Um, In 85, a private investigator witnessed a salesman at Torkington's booth selling watches bearing the name Rolex and the Rolex crown trademark emblem for $27 each. Hey, deal. (laughs) You know, as as, as I was reading this, all I can think of is how good were they? Were they Uh, they good looking... (laughs) All I could think of was it was that guy was Trump <laughs> selling these watches. I'm like, how many bucks Torkington for a... Rolexes does Trump own? <laughs> this was Come on, 27 bucks for a passable fake Rolex? I don't know. I might, I might be willing to plunk down 27. Uh, okay. Deputy Marshall then searched Torkington's booth and the Marshall sees 742 watches bearing the Rolex name and emblem. 
Dorkington was charged with trafficking and attempting to traffic in counterfeit Rolex watches. The district court dismissed both counts. They found that Torkington's watches were not likely to cause direct purchasers of the watches to be confused, mistaken, or deceived about the watch's origins because the cost of the watches was so low. This is important because that goes to the copyright law, and it, and it hinges whether or not there's been a violation hinges upon whether or not the you know purchasers, customers could be deceived by the fake version of whatever it is. Okay, so what they're what the judge the judge in this case the judge canon in this case said was yeah. they're twenty seven bucks. Nobody Come on. thinks they're nobody real. thinks they're real Rolex. Exactly. Furthermore, the district court found that post sale confusion of other members of the public, i.e., people who did not buy the fakes, was not relevant in determining whether a good. <laughs> was counterfeit. That was That's my other the, question. But what yes. about everybody else who didn't know the price of the watch? See, you too could be on the 11th circuit because <laughs> that's what caused the 11th circuit to say, no, you have misread the law. The law requires not just the purchasers of the fake, but all people. So even people who didn't purchase them, if they could have been, you know, basically fooled, then it's a violation of, of the copyright law. Um, okay. So as we know, U S appealed to the 11th circuit and they reversed based on this misreading of copyright. law. Uh, and in, in the end of their case, uh, the end of their opinion, the court reassigned the case to a different judge. Okay. So from the Torkington case, here's some of the, uh, this is the 11th circuit speaking in that case. They said, after considering these elements, we conclude that this case should be reassigned to a different district judge. The judge in this case has been reversed once by this court and dismissed the case at the first opportunity by construing a motion for mistrial as a motion for entry of judgment on acquittal. The judge from the bench questioned the wisdom of the substantive law he had to apply, sound familiar, mm -hmm. and challenged the government's decision to prosecute Torkington. For example, the judge stated at various times that he felt the taxpayer had little interest in this type of suit, that this prosecution was silly, and that it was a waste of taxpayers' money. He also termed the prosecution a, quote, vendetta by Rolex watch against the defendant. We conclude both that the trial judge has demonstrated great difficulty in putting aside his prior conclusions about the merits of this prosecution and that reassignment is necessary to preserve the appearance of impartiality. We consider at least three elements in determining whether to reassign a case to a different judge based on the original judge's actions at trial where there is no indication of actual bias. One, whether the original judge would have difficulty putting his previous views and findings aside. Two, whether reassignment is appropriate to preserve the appearance of justice. And three, whether reassignment would entail waste and duplication out of proportion to gains realized from reassignment. Mm. So there's a so. lot important there. But one of the things I would point to is the way that they load up those three factors. That sentence <laughs> is, we consider the three elements in determining whether to reassign a case to a different judge based on the original judge's actions at trial where there is no indication of actual bias, that's super important for our case because that means there, in this Torkington case, there was no evidence that the judge had been compromised or was, um, you know, there was no way you could prove that the judge was corrupt, right, mm -hmm. in, her, in, in his or her judgments. And we lack that evidence. I know people are going to howl when I say this. We lack that evidence in the Jack Smith, Florida case as well. Yes, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and there's a lot of questions about the decisions that she's made, terrible decisions, but we're not sitting on some sort of smoking gun communication that indicates that she has, she is literally kind of quote unquote in the tank for Trump, that she has been, her loyalty has been compromised or something like that. Right. Like we don't have text messages between exactly. Trump and Cannon's clerk saying, right. Hey, you know, yeah, we don't have that, but you don't need it if you can meet the Torkington factors. Exactly. The court is saying like, even without an indication of actual bias, we'll still remove someone when we don't think that they can be fair going forward, or we need to preserve the appearance of uh, justice. Yep. Or the third. And the, yeah. 
and that it wouldn't be a waste of time to, That's right. <laughs> to, That's to right. reassign it. So in the Torkington case, by the way, what you just read, the judge that was removed had only been reversed once. Whereas yes. if Cannon is reversed here on her dismissal, she will have been reversed three times, twice during the special master debacle, and the third would be overturning her ruling that Jack Smith wasn't appointed or funded properly, you know, her ruling to dismiss the case. The amici have three controversies to support this argument, and we're going to break those down uh, after this break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Okay, now we're back into the amici brief. And over the next several pages, the brief reminds the 11th Circuit of their decisions to reverse canon on the special master controversy, plus two other issues, the jury instruction controversy and this undue delay that they referred to in the intro. In the special master case, which happened before the indictment, you will recall that Trump filed a separate lawsuit to get back all of his documents after the search and to appoint a special master to review them all and determine what the government could have access to. In order to even have his case heard, Donald Trump had to establish jurisdiction in that lawsuit. Because Judge Cannon couldn't find any jurisdiction arguments, she told the parties to brief on jurisdiction and specifically asked for arguments on something called equitable jurisdiction. Now, uh, here's a little history note, a little history lesson in the, in the middle of the law lesson. In British common law, which is where, of course, our law was derived from, there were courts of law, which decided civil cases and awarded damages, and courts of equity, which also decided civil cases, but in a way that was different. The, the goal in the courts of equity was to like return property or land or tangible stuff. And the, and the idea was that courts of equity were really um, just following like a just result as opposed to very strictly following civil law, codified law. So that's the difference between equitable courts and law courts of law. Mm -hmm. There are still some elements of equitable relief in United States federal law, but it's very rare. Most statutes, most laws say, if you do this, if you're guilty of doing this, then you you pay the other person or you pay a penalty or a fine or something like that. Most legal relief is money. But mm -hmm. but in some sometimes you the courts Get your will stuff act back. to give give someone their stuff back exactly. Yeah. And the DOJ argued uh one of my favorite phrases in this whole debacle was sorry, you can't establish equitable jurisdiction through inequitable means. And on more than one occasion I compared that to an episode of the world's dumbest criminals that I saw. It was about a crack deal, a drug deal, where nice. one guy gave the other guy some crack, and then instead of paying for it, the other dude ran away with the that crack happens. and the money. That happens sometimes. Then the other guy actually went up to a cop and asked him if he could help him get his crack back. <laughs> <laughs> that does not happen often. <laughs> no, you cannot get justice for illegal shit. Trump, you can't seek equitable jurisdiction for the stuff you stole. You can't establish equitable jurisdiction through inequitable means. George Conway compared it to what O.J. Simpson actually ended up going to jail for. Mm -hmm. Somebody stole a bunch of his sporting paraphernalia and yes. had it in a hotel room in Vegas. And, and O.J. went in armed, guns blazing, to steal back his stuff. Right. No, you can't steal your stuff and then say, well, I just was getting my stuff back. So anyway, in December of 2022, the 11th Circuit ruled that there was no equitable jurisdiction because the Department of Justice, not Jack Smith, he hadn't been appointed at that time. Right. Uh, actually, I think it was eventually. It was like that was right when the change happened uh, because he came on in November and it was in December. But Merrick Garland and the DOJ argued most of this su yes. uh, special master case. The 11th Circuit ruled no equitable jurisdiction. Judge Cannon, you were wrong. Forced her to vacate her ruling, reversed her ruling. And they also, the second thing they reversed her on was her denial of a stay in the matter so that Jack Smith could appeal to the 11th Circuit. That's she tried right. to shut that down. And so that's a second thing. And I forgot about that. 
yeah. that the, the 11th Circuit overturned. So those are the two prior reversals. And the third reversal would be this one, the dismissing on the uh, appropriateness and funding of the appointment of special counsel Jack Smith. That's right. So then the brief covers two more controversies, the jury instruction and the undue delay. So here's a reminder of the bizarre jury instruction she asked for from the, this comes, this quote comes from the amicus brief. March 18, 2024, Judge Cannon ordered the defense and the government to submit competing drafts of jury instructions on the very Presidential Records Act defense that she had seemed to reject at the previous hearing. And she further ordered that the draft instructions must assume that the following, quote, scenarios were, quote, correct formulations of the law. Scenario. <laughs> they, they, they were not. Yeah. Pretend <laughs> what I'm saying is right and then write me an instruction that says I'm right, basically is what she said. Okay. So scenario A posited that the jury in an Espionage Act prosecution may make factual finding as to whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that a record retained by a former president is personal or presidential using the definition set forth in the Presidential Records Act. Scenario B posited that a president has sole authority under the Presidential Records Act to categorize records as personal or presidential during his, her presidency, that neither a court nor a jury is permitted to make or review such a categorization decision, and that an outgoing president's decision to withhold records from the National Archives must be deemed to be his categorization of those records as personal under the PRA. Yeah. Yeah. Neither of those things are real. Uh, she actually asked the government to assume the law isn't the law and then write up jury instructions based on that legal error. Right. And then, you know, even if um, these... <laughs> Uh, you know, we're, I mean, it was just, it was the most bizarre jury instruction I'd ever read. Uh, and, and the government, Jack Smith wrote a thing. He was like, look, even if you somehow believe that that's what the presidential records act says, this case has nothing to do with the presidential records act because the 11th circuit in your special master BS ruled that these do not belong to him. Right. So <laughs> we, yeah. can we stop? So we have to, you know, we have to use the 11th circuit. We have to do this. And uh, he he uh, filed a, a scathing response, and and uh, she reversed herself on that. So yeah. it's not something the Eleventh Circuit reversed; it's something she reversed herself on. That's right. And let's not forget that in the midst of all of this craziness around, you know, assume this non legal thing is actually the law. And now write a jury instruction for it. The way she teed this up would have kneecapped the government in the middle of the trial because. This wouldn't have come up until it was too late to appeal her misreading of the law, mm -hmm. right? So the jury instructions at the point in the proceeding when you are arguing over jury instructions, it's too late then to take an interlocutory appeal uh, to to challenge the judge's reading of the law. So it was it was both uh, infuriating, but also kind of crafty by her mm -hmm. in a way. And then we saw that again and again in a lot of her decisions in this case. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to rule for the prosecution, but without prejudice. And I'm free. you're free to bring it up later at trial again uh -huh. after it can no longer be appealed. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one thing, you know, they have these three issues here. I'm surprised they didn't add a fourth uh, and a fifth issue. We'll talk about the undue delay in a second uh, as the third issue. But I thought a good fourth and fifth issue would be, first of all, that that ruling, her ruling to unseal witness lists. Yeah. Um, where where Jack Smith filed a, a motion for reconsideration saying, this is a clear legal error. You held us to a higher standard. We only have to show good cause and you're high, uh, holding us to a much higher standard for that. And that's against the law here in the 11th Circuit. Um, here's the, all the case citations and all the precedent. Um, and so I, I thought it was, uh, odd that they didn't include that because, you know, Jack Smith called it a clear legal error that would lead to manifest injustice. Yep. It was very strong language, but they didn't include that in this, uh, amicus brief. And they also didn't include the fact that two judges called her senior judges in the district had called her and told her early on that she should recuse from the case and she refused to do so. And the reason I bring that up is not it, it doesn't necessarily make a difference except when you're talking about the Torkington factors, meaning 
you know, you a reasonable person has to assume that you can't be unbiased. Uh, and if two judges in your district thought maybe it was a good idea, it's not just the public. It's not just the fake New York Times who is, you know, finding that you uh, that the judge might be uh, showing favor here. Right. These are two other judges. So I'm surprised they didn't bring that up, too. Yeah, I think initially when you when you start talking about this, say that yeah, good good argument with respect to the unsealing witnesses thing because it really involved a very you know a misreading of the law, but I think you're onto something here with respect to that factor of preserving the appearance of justice because which is a, according to the Eleventh Circuit and Torkington is a reasonable person standard. Well, in this case, you have a pretty reasonable person. Another federal district judge in the same <laughs> two, courthouse, two who, actually, <laughs> who is, I would argue, per se reasonable, is about as reasonable as you're going to get, saying to her, "You should step down because this is going to look bad." Yeah. So wow. that's a pretty solid piece of evidence on the yes, this is bad for the appearance of justice side. But yeah, they they opted, crew opted not to go with that. But got to hope you got to think that that's lingering in the minds of these Eleventh Circuit justices. But we don't know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. Right. So undue delay is the last one they cover. And uh, they bring it up like this. They say two things were known to the entire world in 2023 <laughs> and 2024. <laughs> Donald Trump historically had pursued a strategy of obstruction and delay in legal cases brought against him. And if he won re-election, he was likely to pardon himself and or instruct his attorney general to drop the federal cases pending against him. That is the context for evaluating the undeniable fact that before administering the coup de grace that ended the case, Judge Cannon failed to resolve numerous pretrial motions and issues, leading many to suspect, rightly or wrongly, that she hoped the case would meet its doom in a second Trump administration. Yeah, and that rightly or wrongly is important here. Because it's the appearance of bias, as, as they said in the factors uh, in, in the Torkington case, there doesn't have to be overt bias. Here. Right. Um, so rightly or wrongly, uh, if the, the appearance of bias exists in, in the minds of reasonable people, including two judges, but they didn't bring that up, you know, um, I, I think she has it here in spades, but there's no hard evidence of it, the bias. But enough of us feel like she's in the bag for Trump to make us question the integrity of the proceeding. Yeah. Yeah, you got to put it in the context of everything else that's going on, even the things that he's said. And um, yeah, I think this is a very sensitive situation. And it's one in which many, many, many people believe, rightly or wrongly, <laughs> that there's some, <laughs> that there's a... Uh, we could all be wrong. She might hate Donald Trump and love the government. What's but <laughs> the Shakespeare line? There's something foul in the state of Denmark or something yeah. like, yeah, something there rotten, is. Rotten Seems like it. Anyway. Uh, the stench, right? Now... The brief then goes over some of the obvious delay that she's caused. Um, and uh, they say, they list, for example, by March 2024, she still hadn't set a trial date. Uh, she created a log jam of unresolved issues on her docket. She held days of hearings on long settled issues. And there were baseless motions that remained inexplicably unresolved. And she didn't hand them off to magistrate judges, which is common in that district. And something that they didn't mention that they probably also could have mentioned was her, se her weird secret docket that yeah. added a whole other layer of litigation on what could be redacted once it's filed on the public docket. They didn't add that. I would have added that. Um, but they, they go on to say Judge Cannon's delays were not entirely attributable to the complexity of the case either, because, you know, that's what Trump always argued, which is a very complicated case. <laughs> uh, and here's where our friend Brian Greer makes a, an appearance. The crew brief says, indeed, former CIA lawyer experienced in Espionage Act prosecutions wrote in May 2024 that, quote, if the defendant were not Donald Trump, this would be a relatively routine Espionage Act prosecution for unlawful retention of classified records. Yet over the course of 11 months, Judge Cannon has made almost no progress. For real. Yeah. Congrats. Congrats, Brian, for, for making it into a brief. There you go. Well done, Brian. So the description of Cannon's undue delay continues. They say Judge Cannon had failed for four months to rule on Trump's motion to compel more discovery from the government. As to dispositive motions, Judge Cannon had ruled on only two of the seven that Trump had filed while insisting on extensive hearings for each one. 
And as to the trial structure, Judge Cannon had not yet addressed a single substantive issue. Still, ahead lay decisions about presidential immunity, attorney-client privilege, and protection of classified information under the Classified Information Protection Act. Judge Cannon's delays were partly attributable to her refusal to delegate pretrial motions to a magistrate judge, a departure from the normal practice that maximized her control over the case. Although Judge Cannon had resolved dispositive motions at a glacial pace, if at all, up to that point, she now moved with the alacrity to end the case. Only two weeks elapsed between Justice Thomas's concurrence and her issuance of a 93-page opinion dismissing the case based on the unconstitutional appointment theory, augmented by an additional unconstitutional spending theory. Mm-hmm. Yep. So she 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 could move fast when she wanted to. Yep. <laughs> And then they wrap up with the Torkington factors established by the 11th Circuit that you laid out earlier. A, Judge Cannon would have difficulty putting her previous views and findings aside on remand. Uh, A reversal here, they say, would mean that the court had to reverse Judge Cannon three times, each time because she reached out to adopt pro-defense practices and theories that directly contradicted longstanding law. Her rulings and other conduct create the appearance of an unshakable conviction that subjecting a former president to ordinary criminal procedures represents an intolerable affront to his dignity. Judge Cannon's unprecedented ruling blocking the government from using or viewing lawfully seized evidence, coupled with her demand that the parties draft jury instructions embodying Trump's baseless PRA defense, would suggest to a reasonable member of the public that her biases will infect and distort a trial on remand. B the second Torkington factor. Reassignment is appropriate to preserve the appearance of justice. And they say even before she dismissed the case on novel grounds that ignored both statutory authority and Supreme Court precedent, Judge Cannon's other extraordinary rulings and sluggish case administration had provoked well-founded concerns that she might be biased against the government's case and unable to manage that case impartially. And the third factor, the gains realized from reassignment would outweigh any waste or duplication. And here they argue that reassignment will not cause undue waste or duplication as the case has yet to be tried. Indeed, much of the district court's pretrial work remains unfinished and prior published opinions will help the next district judge master the essential facts and issues in the case. So uh, those are their three uh, Torkington, I almost said Turkleton, Torkington arguments. (laughs) Well, they finish Turkleton and they conclude, although Judge Cannon sometimes has appeared to be forging a parallel legal universe for former presidents, there's one respect in which Trump's unique status and global visibility ought to influence the reassignment analysis. Those factors arguably make it more important than in any prior case that justice should not only be done, but should manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. Nice, nice citation of white there. So yeah. there you go. That's um, the crew uh, brief. And um, I want to go over a, a little bit the second brief, which, you know, makes a lot of the same arguments, but they also in the next uh, brief we're going to go over, argue the dismissal of the case. They argue against the dismissal of the case for the inappropriate funding and appointment of Jack Smith. And we'll we'll hit that as soon as we take one more break. So everybody, no, actually we have two more breaks this show, but You know what I mean. We'll be right back. Welcome back. All right, let's go over the other amicus brief. This one is filed by Matthew Seligman on behalf of 18 people and entities, including George Conway, Lawrence Tribe, and Olivia Troy. I know them. Yeah, ditto. This brief is longer, 73 pages, because not only do they argue that Judge Cannon should be removed from the case, but they also offer their arguments on why her dismissal should be overturned. Uh, So their arguments for removing Judge Cannon are basically the same as the crew arguments, that Judge Cannon, quote, has engaged in conduct that gives rise to the appearance of a lack of impartiality in the mind of a reasonable member of the public under Torkington, and that the 11th Circuit has the authority to remove and reassign the case under 28 U.S.C. 2106. So that stuff we've all, we talked about in the context of the crew brief. Their argument that Jack Smith was appointed and funded properly is summarized as follows. The Constitution, 
the statutes enacted by Congress to exercise the power that the Constitution confers, and the Attorney General's appointment pursuant to that constitutional and statutory authority unmistakably established the lawfulness of the Special Counsel Smith's appointment. The District Court's contrary conclusion was incorrect. Both the District Court and apparently Mr. Trump recognize that the Special Counsel qualifies as an inferior officer and thus that the Attorney General could, consistent with the Constitution, appoint Special Counsel Smith if Congress had vested him with that power. The District Court held, however, that Congress had not done so, and therefore Mr. Smith's appointment was unlawful. That conclusion defies the plain text of Section 533, which unambiguously authorizes the Attorney General to, quote, appoint officials like the special (laughs) counsel to, quote, prosecute crimes against the United States, 28 U.S.C. 533. To reach its outlier interpretation, the district court ignored the statute's plain text to hold that, quote, officials does not include, quote, officers like the special counsel, and it defied the commands of Congress in its enacting legislation to hold that Section 533 authorizes the appointment of officials only to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. (laughs) And then they they go on to say, this is great, the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit's cases confirm this straightforward statutory authority. The Supreme Court affirmed the Attorney General's authority to appoint a special counsel in Nixon. Now, the court explained that Congress, quote, vested in the Attorney General the power to appoint subordinate officers to assist him in the discharge of his duties, right? And that's citing 28 U.S. Code sections 509, 510, 515, and 533, the four things we've been talking about. Yep. They go on to say, as the D.C. Circuit recently recognized, the Supreme Court's binding precedent thus establishes that Congress has, by law, vested authority in the attorney general to appoint a special counsel as an inferior officer. Um, And for this court to conclude to the contrary would thus create a conflict between the 11th Circuit and the D.C. Circuit that would require the Supreme Court to intervene. Yeah, and then they discuss Judge Cannon's ruling that Nixon is, quote, mere dicta, meaning that it's not legally binding. Here's what they say about that. The district court justified its dramatic departure from binding precedent by suggesting that Nixon's statutory holding is mere dicta. That suggestion is incorrect. <laughs> There's a lot of sentences that end with the word incorrect. The court in Nixon faced the question whether the president could invoke executive privilege to defy a subpoena issued by the Watergate special prosecutor. The court determined that this conflict gave rise to a justiciable case between an independent special prosecutor with his asserted need for the subpoenaed material and a president with his steadfast assertion of privilege against disclosure. The court based that determination on its conclusion that the Department of Justice regulation gives the special prosecutor explicit power to contest the invocation of executive privilege in the process of seeking evidence deemed relevant to the performance of these specially delegated duties. So long as this regulation is extant, it has the force of law. So (laughs) just to pause for a second here, what they basically said was, yes, there's a justiciable... case between what the special prosecutors asked for and what the president has refused to provide. And in order for there to be a justiciable case there, both of those parties have to be legitimate, essentially, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If the special prosecutor was not duly authorized or unconstitutional, there would be no case because a special prosecutor without any legal authority couldn't request anything from a president. So that's kind of how that overlaps and uh their their holding that he is in fact lawful is is core to their hearing the case at all Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. and they say that uh, a paragraph down they say the existence of that justiceable controversy thus depended on the lawfulness of the appointment of the special prosecutor exactly that's what the Amicus goes on to say, they say that is precisely why the Supreme Court made a point to state the statutory authority on which that appointment was based. Uh, See in Ray Grand Jury Investigation, which they then quote from, Attorney General statutory authority to appoint the special counsel is a necessary antecedent to determining whether the regulations under which the special prosecutor is appointed were valid. 
which in turn was necessary to the decision that a justiciable controversy existed. Accordingly, the Supreme Court statement that 533 authorized the Attorney General to appoint the special prosecutor was not mere dicta, but binding precedent for lower courts to follow. Yep. So, Judge Cannon, wrong. <laughs> Incorrect. <laughs> Uh, what was that? Issue number four. <laughs> <laughs> McLaughlin. Oh my God. I got to go to YouTube and watch some of those. I love that show. Do you remember when, when Dana Carey did it? Remember when Dana Carey did it? You Dana are Carvey. Wrong. Sorry, Dana Carvey. Um, they go on to conclude this is how they conclude their brief. Uh, because the plain text of the statute and binding authority from the Supreme Court established that Congress authorized Attorney General Garland to appoint the special counsel the court should hold that the special counsel's appointment is lawful. For the reasons stated above, the court should reverse the judgment below. In addition, the amici urge this court to exercise its supervisory authority under 28 U.S. Code 2106 to reassign the matter to another district judge on remand. And Andy, they put a footnote here to remind the court that they can do that sua sponte. There you go. There okay. you go. Um, yeah. Well done. Well written. Well done. Yeah. And uh, good that we've got folks weighing in on these things and kind of supplementing the special counsel's record. So, yeah, it's hard to see. I mean, God, I feel like I've, I'm cursing myself here because we all said this about the immunity case. We said, there's no way. There's no way <laughs> that he comes out of the Supreme Court with total immunity. And then he did. So at the risk I think of, the 11th Circuit will do the right thing here, I whether the Supreme so. Court that's, does. That's, I mean, maybe we're just being unduly optimistic, but um, man, it just seems like this one is really stacked up against her in, in very considerable ways. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see. Uh, obviously, we'll keep you posted. Yep. Um, we have one more quick story, and then we're going to take some listener questions, but we have to take one last quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back. All right. One last quick thing I wanted to cover before we get to listener questions. And this was sparked by one of the dozens of documented lies told by Donald Trump during his trouncing on the debate stage Tuesday night. And this is something we hear from right wingers and Russian backed podcasters all the time that Donald Trump's 2020 election cases never got to the merits. He said this during the debate. They were all dismissed on standing, a technicality. They said, I had no standing. Imagine that, a president without standing. Uh, he went off on that for a while. Well, Rich Bernstein from the Society for the Rule of Law, which was established by like Judge Ludwig and uh, George Conway. There's a conservative uh, think tank. And also Rich Bernstein, former clerk for Justice Scalia. He has some things to say about this Trump claim. He says, to cite just a handful of 2020 cases, many decisions rejected merits arguments offered by Mr. Trump, his campaign, his electors, and his supporters. State Supreme Courts in Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin rejected such arguments as wrong on the merits. Trump v. Biden, Ward v. Jackson, Law v. Whitmer, and canvas of absentee and mail-in ballots of November 3rd, 2020 general election, to name a few. He went on to say federal circuit courts covering Pennsylvania and Wisconsin also rejected claims by Trump and his campaigns on the merits. See Trump v. Wisconsin Election Commission, Donald Trump for President, Inc. v. Secretary, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I mean, he's and the then, party in that one. Yeah. He's yeah. the named party. Yeah. So uh, and then he, he says, and so did a number of state trial courts and federal trial courts uh, in Michigan. Now, even in Georgia, he says, Trump cannot blame standing because he failed to pursue properly uh, his express and undisputed right as a candidate to bring an election contest in the Georgia state courts. See Trump versus Ra Trump v. Raffensperger. In addition, in Georgia, in one federal trial court, they rejected the claims of a Trump supporter on independent alternative grounds of standing latches. Am I saying that right? <laughs> you are. And being wrong on the merits. C. Wood v. Raffensperger. Also, a word about Mr. Trump's court losses that relied on latches as, as a grounds, right? Latches is not a mere technical ground for rejecting a post-election legal claim. Latches protects voters against post-election gotcha claims. Take, for example, the use of drop boxes for absentee ballots. Well before the 2020 election, Wisconsin election officials informed voters and candidates that one way to submit an absentee ballot 
was by using a Dropbox. No candidate challenged that procedure before the election. But after the election, Mr. Trump sought to throw out absentee ballots deposited in drop boxes in two counties that Biden had won by large margins. Courts used latches to protect voters against this belated gotcha argument because if the argument had been made successfully before the election, voters could and would have voted by other means, including mailing the ballot or voting in person. Bottom line, he says, just as Mr. Trump lost the election in 2020, he lost many court claims challenging those results based on the merits. <laughs> so it's not just about standing. I'm standing right here, so I must have <laughs> lost on the merits. It was a technicality. Technicality. Yeah. No, nah, not at all. All right. At least he didn't try to say latches. Ah. <laughs> I lost on leeches. <laughs> they were sucking the blood from me in my campaign. For sure. Um, all right, questions. Yeah, listener questions. Yeah, and we have a link, everybody, in the show notes that you can click on to submit your questions to to uh, Andy and me. What do we have uh, this week? All right. <clears throat> this why I picked this one will become clear only when I get to the end of it. But <laughs> this one comes to us from Mike from Manchester. He says, hi, Allison and Andy. I've been an avid listener of the pod since the outset uh, out here in Manchester, a small hamlet in the northwest of England. Not only do you manage to explain the intricacies of the process, um, you do it in an informative and amusing way, but it appears you also have some excellent musical taste as well. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester has produced some of the world's greatest bands and the New Order, uh, I'm sorry, not the, just New Order, The Smiths, <laughs> James, Stone Roses. And then he sent us another message in which he basically said, oh, I forgot to add Oasis. So thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> oh, sit down. Oh, sit yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. That's so, well, no, that's not Oasis. That's James. I'm just being clear there. there. But I think sit huge... down because I don't want to hear Oasis. <laughs> All right. So I'll just give you Stone Roses then because I'm a huge Stone Roses fan. All right. Anyway, on to my question. After watching the Harris v. Trump presidential debate, I've seen on my socials that the Donald may have admitted to some more criming. Could you please explain what the Logan Act is <laughs> and what he may have done wrong? So this brought back so many, like, um, I don't know, seizures from, from the Michael the, Flynn days. Michael Flynn days. I was like, yeah. oh, my God, I guess we should we oh, should actually God. answer this. Um, the all right. Logan Act is a toothless... Yes. beast that uh, has never once successfully been prosecuted in the history of the United States. And that is why I know people want it to be a thing, but it will never be a thing. Exactly. Exactly right. Uh, U.S. Code 18 U.S.C. 953. I think it was was uh, made law in 1917, if I remember correctly. Uh, but in any case, never really been successfully prosecuted. People talked about it a lot as the only motivation we had for bringing the case against Mike Flynn. That is <laughs> not true. It was not true then. It is not true now. Yes, in our conversations, people brought it up like, wow, it could actually be a Logan Act. Like in the context of like, God, look at that. We might have actually hit on a Logan yeah, Act, which yeah. we didn't and we didn't pursue it. But it basically prohibits private citizens from engaging in um, like diplomatic government, discussions diplomatic with stuff. foreign governments, right? So when you have discussions idea. in the, in like when you just mentioned that, you know, oh, I might even have a Logan Act here. Do you have any discussions at the Department of Justice about the Logan Act at all? I mean, like, are there, is there, is there ever any like, oh, well, this is possibly Logan Act, but we've never successfully prosecuted it. So we're not going to bring it. It's never even considered, is it? 21 years. This was the only time I'd ever heard the, the law mentioned. I didn't know what it was the first time I heard. Of course, looked it up and and realized that like on the surface, it seemed to fit like Mike Flynn was a private citizen, the president who he would be working for. Trump had not been on, inaugurated yet. So there was no Trump administration. And yet he was interacting directly with the ambassador from Russia and, and substantively like negotiating votes on UN Security Council issues, things like that. Um, but it's not something it's never there's no prosecutorial record. Nobody was looking to do that. It was really just kind of a, a weird kind of thing. Um, what we were concerned about was that, you know, this might be indication of the link between the Trump campaign, which was, I guess, then the Trump transition team, 
uh, was actually linked to the Russians. But anyway, that's that's why do you uh, think it's never been brought? Because I mean, there is I mean, it has some teeth. I mean, there is a like a small fine and, you know, up to three years in prison. I least. think, well, I, I think because it exists in a gray area, um, it is fairly common for members of the transition team to contact uh, representatives of foreign government during that intermission period, but not in the way that was done here. It's usually like introductions and who should we speak to and let's line up a call from my guy to your guy on inauguration day or the day after, that sort of thing. It's like, ceremonial, la, la, la. But it does happen. So if you're looking at, you know, any case, if you ever tried to bring a case based on that, you would have to deal with some very strong motions of like selective prosecution because people Mm. are not prosecuted for that. Got it. So that's why I think that alone would make it a very tough case to bring. So it's not like something like seditious conspiracy where it's only been brought a couple of times successfully in the history of the country, but you're not going to face those same pretrial motion hurdles with a a case like that uh, as you would with a Logan Act. Yeah. And seditious conspiracy is a very serious charge, right? Thankfully, it doesn't happen. We don't really typically have the factual basis to bring that charge. Whereas here is almost kind of the exact opposite. Logan Act, almost every incoming brand new administration, you don't see it it's not an issue between from an administration that's been reelected, obviously, because they're already in. So it's only new administrations and it happens with most of them. There's some sort of low level contact and, you know, that sort of thing. But what we were worried about here was a national security threat, a, a counterintelligence threat. And that's what we were investigating. But anyways, that was, I thought, an interesting question. And I, <laughs> we had to go through it so I could get over my my uh, seizure on having read the Logan Act again. <laughs> All right. So last question comes to us from Le Crazy Frog, which uh-huh. I think maybe some sort of allusion to f- French uh, affiliation there. Uh, this person says, hello to the two, uh, I'm sorry, hello to two of the smartest legal commentators whose laser sharp analysis and their mellow and captivating voices are always <laughs> fascinating to listen to. Well done. (laughs) I'm going to overlook the run on sentence there because I just love it. All right. Quick question regarding Mike Pence issue. It seems to me that the presumptive immunity bar is fairly straightforward to overcome. Would it be possible for Jack Smith to argue that if it was a some other president not seeking reelection that was in place on January 6th, the conversation with Pence would clearly not have taken place. Therefore, it was not an official act but the act of a candidate. I see. Kind of of an interesting question. Um, I do think she's onto something there. And I think the more effective use of this fact pattern would be to say, if a conversation had taken place between a president who was not running for office and his current vice president on January 6th, then clearly that is not official. That's not part of the president's duties. That is purely- And and, uh, the sitting president not running for re-election would have no reason to have that conversation. Exactly. That's what I was trying to get to, but I was circling it. And Jack Smith alludes to that in his superseding indictment. And I talked about this in my Substack piece about why he added the phrase, you know, who also Mm -hmm. happened to be president, Donald Trump, who also happened to be president at the time, right? Because it's, it's secondary. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, when uh, the crazy frog, when we talk about this is a candidate talking to the president of the Senate, not a president talking to his vice president, you're exactly right. And this may be an argument that Jack Smith might make to prove that he was acting as a candidate and not as the president. Because this conversation with Pence or the president of the Senate would never have taken place in the first, yeah. if, if he weren't running for office. I think you're definitely going to hear it. You're going to mm-hmm. hear it because of that. And you're also going to, you're going to hear it because it's president candidate speaking to president of the Senate, but it's also candidate, candidate speaking to co-candidate. Yeah. Running mate. Speaking to the other guy, the running mate, the guy who's running with him, like Pence 
was also Pence had something to gain theoretically by doing the wrong thing there if he had chosen to do that. So I, whether or not the argument's going to win, I don't know, but I think it's a valid argument, and I think we'll hear something like that when this yeah. case goes forward. Well done. Yeah. Excellent questions. Thank you very much. Again, there's a link in the show notes where you can ask us questions. And um, we will see you uh, next week. It's going to be very interesting uh, to see when, you know, because this, the brief on immunity in the D.C. case isn't due until September 26th. But the appeals, right, down in Florida, we have now have these two amicus briefs, and we should be able to see some resolution on these uh, fairly fairly soon, I think. Yeah. I don't know that the 11th Circuit, um, I think they're still waiting to be fully briefed. And then once they're fully briefed, they have a couple of weeks to schedule the oral argument, right? Yep. Uh, it will definitely be after the election, just so everybody knows. <laughs> Um, and then we'll know also who it's going to be assigned to, which three judge panel. That's that's when they once they're in fully fully briefed, then they assign the case to a three judge panel. So we'll keep you posted as always. But thanks for listening and thanks for your questions. Do you have any final thoughts today, Andy? No, I mean I think another week that we didn't have any major filings, but I think these two amicus briefs were really interesting and definitely add to the kind of context that we're that we're thinking about down in uh, Florida. So yeah, you never know what's going to come down the pike. And the only way to find out is to tune in again next week and see. Yeah. And I wrote this up, these amicus briefs. I wrote them up on uh, my sub stack, com. Check that out if you want. It's free over there. And thanks for listening. And everybody, we'll see you next week. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Andy McCabe. Bye.